Okay, uh, hello. Um, I'm Aaron. Uh, I'm an engineer at Etsy.com. Um, I'm going to be talking about um, recent efforts that we've undertaken to make our existing Hadoop pipelines faster. Um, so this isn't really going to be like a, a sexy talk where you get like a high-level perspective on some like idealized view of some new technique that you'll want to run home and play with. Um, but it is going to be talking about like actual problems that we've seen in our own sort of legacy code base of a kind of a lot of Hadoop stuff. Um, so uh, it, this kind of presumes that you're already uh, practicing Hadoop users. Um, but uh, yeah, so I, I hope to at least be, be helpful in terms of exposing things that we've actually seen and you might actually see in the future or, or already have and not know about. Um, okay, so uh, it, I have to put my company for a second. Um, if you're not familiar, um, Etsy is an online marketplace for mostly handmade and vintage goods. Um, so it's, it's e-commerce for stuff that people either make or curate. Um, so for instance, if you wanted to buy a, a unique garment or like a one-of-a-kind piece of art or vintage furniture or something, Etsy is a great place to do that. Um, primarily for our purposes, that's only really useful to you in, insofar as some of my examples might uh, make it clear that I'm talking about e-commerce stuff. Um, Okay, so uh, before I can like, get into the particular performance problems that um, I'll, I'll discuss, and there will be three of them, um, I need to sort of take a, oh, by the way, the handmade thing is why I have handmade slides, if you were wondering. Um, but okay, so I need to take a step back and talk about um, how Hadoop happens at Etsy. Um, and basically, until relatively recently, everything was in EMR. Um, I don't know how many of you people use Amazon Web Service stuff uh, on a regular basis, but if you're not familiar, EMR is um, just a service that lets you uh, kick off virtual clusters um, that only survive as long as they need to run your particular set of jobs. Um, and so this is just sort of showing how data moves around our system. Um, in particular, uh, we're constantly shuttling data back and forth between our own databases and log data and um, S3, and that becomes kind of a bottleneck, which is of some concern, um, as is the, the cost of storage in S3 and constantly firing up new clusters. Um, but sort of uh, this, this paradigm of having clusters only live as long as your particular job um, brings with it a bunch of sort of bad habits um, for, for, for programmers. Um, so uh, for, for various reasons, like uh, for instance, if you have the, the idea that um, clusters um, only live a short while and so you only pay for nodes while you're using them, then when you run into a job that's causing you problems, um, a frequent solution is to rather than understand why it's problematic, to just throw more nodes at it or throw bigger and more expensive nodes at it until it works. Um, and for instance, you, you end up with weird things where like, if you start a job that only lives for three minutes before it fails and your cluster disappears, uh, you pay for the whole hour. And like, there's, there's various reasons why this was um, no longer ideal for us. Uh, so we decided to move our, uh, our large set of um, regularly scheduled stuff in EMR um, to an in-house cluster in uh, our own hardware in our own data center. Um, Here's our, our cluster, isn't she pretty? Um, but so as soon as we started running stuff in a long running cluster, we were able to see a lot more low level detail about the particulars of the jobs that we were running. Um, so things like, uh, well, I'll, I'll get into the particulars. Um, but basically we saw that a lot of stuff was really not performant. Um, so, so one example uh, is um, a, a lot of people deal with lots of log data, and we're, we're one of those contexts where um, we try to log as much as we can and then sort of squeeze as much useful insight out of that log data as we can. Um, the, the first step in any pipeline dealing with log data is, of course, to parse apart your logs into sort of useful, semantically valuable fields. Um, and at that, that very key step at the, the head of our entire like um, regularly scheduled pipeline, um, was really terribly behaved when we ran it on our own hardware. In particular, it caused enormous and long-lived GC spikes on um, basically all the, the mapper uh, JVMs um, for that particular job. Um, and it was totally not uh, IO bound, which we would have expected to, it to be. Um, and just like in terms of a sort of like gigabytes per node per like period of time, it was not like where we expected it to be. So we, um, we dug into our, our um, particular parsing implementation, which no one had looked at for, for many, many months. Um, and uh, 
when we year kitted it, this is what we saw. Um, so this is probably too, too small to make out like the, the detail, but this is an extremely long stack of uh, Scala parser combinators. Does anyone in here use this stuff? Well, are there Scala users in the room? Okay, so I see the people that raise their hands are smiling a little bit. Um, so uh, one of the, the sort of lessons that all this performance tuning brings for us is that there are a lot of um, sort of things that programmers can try to optimize for, like one of them is performance, and frequently for us that was not the case. Other things that you can try to optimize for are like development time, which frequently was the case, or the prettiness and maintainability of your code. Um, and so one of our, our engineers, um, selected this as, as our, our technique for how to parse apart logs. Um, and it's not that parser combinators are inherently evil. And if you're not familiar, it's just a way of saying, like, I know how to parse um, a small piece of, say, for instance, a quoted string or um, a comma delimited array that's surrounded by square brackets. And I can take these small pieces and combine them into logic for how to parse um, something larger that's composed of these small pieces. Um, that's a totally, reason, totally reasonable way to write parsing logic, but not for log lines. Um, so I want to bring up the point that like, when we use the word parser, that can mean many different things. If it's not clear, this is meant to be a Venn diagram in which uh, none of the sets actually intersect. Um, but so like parsing and natural language processing can mean like you have PCFGs and like for a particular sentence, it's ambiguous what parse tree actually goes with it. And there you need very expensive parsing code, right? And if you're talking about like implementing natural language, uh, sorry, if you're talking about implementing a programming language, you need to be able to handle arbitrary uh, programs written in, in your language that might have like, you know, very deep recursion and embedding and all kinds of stuff. Um, but when you're talking about your own logs, you get to enforce the simplicity of their format. You can like tell the people that are writing in your code base that if you're going to log, you log in this particular way. It needs to be flat and simple. And you can make it cheap to parse. Um, so none of the techniques that are like fancy and complicated um, need to be involved at this low level of something you're doing tens of millions or hundreds of millions or billions of times per day. Um, that's just ridiculous. So in our case, we tore out the Scala uh, parser combinator stuff and we replaced it with um, a very dead simple left to right parser um, with very minimal look ahead um, and which kept relatively careful track of its object allocations. And the particular job at the, the head of our like, daily pipeline for consuming log data um, ran 10 times faster um, because we got rid of this. Um, so this, this, this isn't about um, a developer doing something that was obviously wrong at the time. This is about the developer picking something that was um, about the, the prettiness of the way the code looked or like the uh, ability to read how your parser looks in like 10 lines of code or something, um, which was uh, just not the right thing to optimize when we were actually got to the point of being concerned about performance. Um, okay, next like embarrassing wart um, in, in our code base. Um, so uh, anyone who's, who's written much Hadoop code has had to implement a bunch of writables or writable comparables or whatever. Um, and we all know that it's tedious. Um, so like a frequent pattern is um, take your particular logic or like the thing you're representing, um, find something that gets like 80% of your work done that's already in the Hadoop code base and then write around it, right? Like let that do the heavy lifting and then like tack on some business logic or like a few extra uh, particular fields for the thing you're recording, um, but let the code that's already in Hadoop do the work for you. Um, so I, I need to take a step back and talk about how we think about log data. Um, when you're talking about log lines, right, there's a bunch of fields that you expect to be everywhere, things like timestamp or like some kind of ID for like the customer or the browser or whatever, um, and uh, maybe the kind of page you're talking about. Um, but then you have a bunch of fields that are sort of one-off and particular to the type of thing you're logging, right? So if you're logging um, about a search page, you want to capture the query and the search results in the order that they were given and blah, 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 right? And if you're talking about like a profile view page for a particular user, you want to capture what that user ID was and whether the person viewing it already was like in a friendship relationship with that person or whatever. Um, so right, for, for log data in general, this means that we have like some fields that are mandatory, a small number of them, and then a bunch of fields that are like field name, field value, you can capture it easily in a map from string to string. Um, so some of you will already know the Hadoop code base has map writable. Um, and so an engineer 
thought that like this is a great way way to save time rather than um, taking care of the serialization for this map from field name to field value on my own, I'll piggyback on map writable. Um, the problem uh, is map writable uh, is written in a way that it's, it's not parameterized um, like for a particular kind of key and a particular kind of value, it's generic, or sorry, it's, uh, it's written in a way that like you can stick arbitrary uh, keys and values in there, and so it needs to be able to, um, well, it needs to be able to keep track of um, what particular classes you're dealing with in any particular map, and it does that by carrying around this extra dictionary that records class names, and then whenever you read back in, it uses reflection using those class names um, to create classes and then instantiate your, your actual values that get stuck into your map. And so in our case, when you're talking about log data, um, if you only care about um, reflection is ugly, um, if you only care about uh, string keys and string values, it's silly to have that extra data structure that's just um, carrying around class information. And it's really silly if you're going to have lots and lots of keys and lots and lots of values to instantiate all of them with reflection. Um, so cut that out. Um, so we, we lost a factor of code reuse in terms of booting our use of map writable and instead wrote um, a very simple, lots of boilerplate, um, string string map writable like that was specific to our case um, and that meant that every single job that dealt with um, data about a user interacting with some page which is essentially all of our jobs um, got some notable and measurable speed up um, just because we were using the wrong thing. So it's, um, it's easy to, to, I guess, be lazy and look at sort of like um, the particular promises that um, something that you found in the code base uh, will give you. Um, but if you don't actually look at how it's making the sausage, um, then you can shoot yourself in the foot. Um, okay. Uh, here's another ugly wart um, that comes from uh, different developers having different preferences for what tools they use. Um, so uh, in the, peop the, the group of people in, in my company that deal with like writing Hadoop jobs, we have a bunch of people that love writing in Java, and that's what they've done for a long time, and they do it really well. Um, and we have a bunch of people that like Scala. And the people that write in Java don't want to have to depend on any of the Scala nonsense. And the people that write in Scala don't want to have to give up their syntactic sugar. And so when we're talking about dealing with log data, like people interacting with, with like particular pages, um, we ended up having two kinds of representations for that data. And there was the Java one that actually took care of the serialization. Um, so so this, is, uh, this is the pattern that we had. So event writable is the name for the, the Java representation um, that has like an actual Java util map inside. Um, but the Scala people want to be able to use Scala maps, which let you do syntactically pretty things like adding in a key value pair using plus equal syntax or whatever. Um, and so solely for that reason, and, and on the like um, political decision that the, the Scala representation and the Java representation should be equal peers, um, the, the Scala representation needed to be populated or created um, by dumping out every entry in the Java map into a new Scala mutable map, um, which meant that um, if you have someone writing um, that likes writing their, their operations inside Scala, um, then they have to do a, a conversion on the way in and a conversion on the way out, um, neither of which is free, and both of which touch the data like every piece of it once. Um, and so uh, this is ridiculous. Um, the people that, that used Scala were some of the most prolific um, people that were producing new pipelines or new uh, sequences of Hadoop job to our code base. And so this um, performance hit was basically everywhere. So the solution, which is probably obvious when you, when you look at it from this perspective as versus the I want plus equals syntax prettiness perspective, um, is that they don't have to be equal peers to get the benefits that we want. So we can have uh, the event writable not depend on any Scala, and we can have the Scala representation merely be a wrapper around the Java uh, representation and like delegate down to it, and then using um, uh, Scala 
Java conversion magic. Um, the Scala people get to touch a, a Scala map, but whenever they mutate it, it's mutating the Java map under the, under the covers. And so um, on the, the way in, our conversion is just like object instantiations. It's like two, so it's cheap. And on the way out, it's, it's just like kicking out a field that we, we already had. It's dereferencing, essentially. Um, so that saves us uh, basically across a large number of jobs um, some, some constant speed up. So all of these are like just dumb things that are only dumb when you look at them from the perspective of like um, the, the low level behavior is silly, but um, the high level characteristics that people got out of it at the time made sense. Um, okay, uh, next I'm going to try to quickly go through uh, how you find these things. How do you find the, the parts of your code base um, that are particularly hairy or like costing you a lot. Um, so actually, I, I need to um, mention uh, one of the quirks about how Etsy write to do. Um, and in particular, we, we use cascading, but um, that wasn't a high enough level of abstraction. Um, so we use a DSL um, called cascading.jruby that lets us write cascading flows slightly more tersely. Um, and then on top of that, we have, um, I think it's like, we, we have hundreds of jobs written in cascading.jruby. Um, any of these might translate into anywhere from a handful to several dozen Hadoop jobs when it actually executes. Um, and all of this is aided by like a libraries of operators that are written in um, both Java and Scala. But it's, it's the, we have hundreds of jobs that produce anywhere from few to several dozen Hadoop jobs that's um, the main problem for profiling. Um, so I accidentally give you a slight hint. Um, so, so basically, uh, like when you, when you have one JVM, Profiling is kind of, we all know how to do it, right? Um, the, the only trick to this, and this is, this is very much common sense, um, the, the only trick is that like, when you spin out um, hundreds of thousands of JVMs in an evening, um, right, where, where every, every Hadoop job that you run has hundreds of maps and hundreds of reduces, um, then figuring out what your profiling data means. Like Hadoop gives you an easy route to, to plug in a profiler and produce snapshots on exit. And like it's, um, if you look at the Hadoop book and there's basically a straightforward way to plug in, plug in the profiler of your choice. Um, we, use, we happen to use your kit. Um, but then once you have hundreds of thousands of, uh, of snapshots and they comprise multiple terabytes of data, um, how do you deal with it? Um, so the answer to the people in this room should be obvious, but I don't think I've actually seen people talk about this before. So I want to like establish this as a pattern that actually happens in the real world. Um, take your hundreds of thousands of uh, snapshots, dump them in HDFS, um, write a special splitter that respects your, you know, your file boundaries, um, extract whatever data you need out of every snapshot, and aggregate it using Hadoop. So it sounds ridiculous that we have a little bit, that we, we have Hadoop jobs whose sole responsibility is now to analyze the performance characteristics of our other Hadoop jobs, but it's also really empowering to be able to say, out of hundreds of thousands of JVMs that ran last night, um, or we're getting to the upper end of that, that boundary. Um, which particular methods cost me the most in CPU time? And it's a lot of data and it's some crunching, um, but it allows you as a developer to really efficiently say, if I'm gonna spend three hours optimizing away something in my code base, what gets me the best bang for the buck? And it also lets you sanity check, because if you, if you do this and you aggregate like which methods are costing me the most or which sections of stack are costing the most, um, then if they're all things like compression or uh, reading from sockets or uh, serializing and deserializing strings, then you're probably doing something, you're, you're probably doing reasonably well. But if you see crazy things like reflection while you're instantiating stuff inside MapWritable, then you know exactly where the crazy is that you need to go and, and root out. Um, okay, so I, I, that's essentially my content. If you have uh, more questions than I can answer during this period, this is my contact info. Um, that username will also let you reach me um, pretty much anywhere on the internet. Um, so uh, yeah, th th that's how we, we fix Hadoop at Etsy. Um, let me know if you have any comments or questions you'd like to share. Thank you. Any questions? Um, for your serialization, did you consider using something like Avro, where you can say, I have a schema and I have fields and they can be optional and they, have, they are typed so that you don't have to write all that stuff yourself because there's good support in MapReduce for um, Avro writable, so you basically can enforce a schema and it's even portable amongst languages, so you can do it in Python and Ruby and 
God knows what. Uh, yeah, we, we have actually looked at Avro. Um, one of the most awesome things about Avro that I, I didn't talk about here, but we've also looked at in terms of um, performance boosts, is actually um, that Doug Cutting realized that um, string serial deserialization ought to be lazy, um, right? So like everywhere in Avro that you normally would have, um, where otherwise you would have strings, you have UTF-8 objects, which um, don't actually go through the, dec the decoding process until you need to. And so yeah, there's a lot of, perf and for other reasons, there's various reasons uh, that, that Avro can be a, a good benefit. Um, for us, uh, because we have this pattern of storing ridiculous amounts of data in S3 for long periods of time, we frequently do analyses that go back far in time, like a year or 18 months um, or more. And so we wanted to be able to preserve sort of backwards compatibility about being able to um, to consume old data. So, so one thing I didn't mention is that when I talked about like switching up um, our, our writables, uh, we were able to do that in a way that preserved serialization level compatibility, where we can read old data into the new um, the new representation, and we can um, even write old data into the uh, from the from the new representation and roll back our code and read it in the old one. Like it's it's um, compatible both ways. Um, for, for that reason, and because we didn't want to like, have large batch operations that had to migrate all our historical data into some new representation or schema, um, for that reason, partly, we haven't gone to Avro yet. Uh, we might look at it in the future. The, the only other awkwardness is um, getting um, Avro to work under cascading, which I think is a little bit of, of um, labor that we haven't fully investigated like, what, that, what that implies. Um, I think... Yeah, we've got one last one question. Quick question. Any, any of the work you did on the Meta Hadoop jobs that dump the um, profiling information and get that back into HGFS, any of that open source? Um, not currently. It's actually like, it's really small. Like there's, there's only like two pieces of logic to it. One is um, when your snapshots get generated on your slaves, you need to dump them into HGFS and make sure that you don't have file name collisions um, because a lot of snapshotters will like, only make sure that you don't collide with things that are already like in the directory where you're writing. Um, and then like particular to how you snapshot, you need to be able to like extract whatever information you care about. And then uh, the aggregation is just like, you know, it's the bread and butter to people that use Hadoop anyways. Um, so f frankly, uh, we, we might bother open sourcing that. We might not, uh, if you're in the position of wanting to do that, um, certainly contact and ask. Um, but it should be very little labor to do. Um, I think primarily the thing that was empowering t was to, to know that it was possible and to realize that um, the, the information that you get out of it allows you to make much smarter decisions about where you spend your time in, in performance tuning things in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you.